All right, maybe we'll get started here. Um, Kate, are you going to be recording it, or is that something I need to do? I've taken care of it. All right, good deal. Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started, guys. Um, first of all, my name is Eric Prose. I don't know if uh, I think I've met a lot of you, but um, with the Akron chapter, uh, working up in Cleveland these days, and um, great to meet all of you. Thank you all for being here today. I think you um, understand the value of what we're trying to do here. Um, we're going to try to be quick. Allison uh, is on the call. She's part of the task force, and she has a lot of information for you, but she has limited time. So I'm going to try to be very brief with the introduction here, but kind of set the stage and then turn it over to her so we can really hear uh, about the programming needs that we've learned. Um, but just a quick background. Uh, we released the, uh, the call for entries about two weeks ago, and then today is the, the programming session where um, throughout the, that two-week period, we've been getting survey results back from um, different institutes of education around the state to kind of hear their needs, get a, get a kind of a firsthand uh, look at what that need is from the users that are kind of on the ground level. Um, so we're not just kind of working in a vacuum. And I think we all understand there's a lot of challenges coming their way. And today, hopefully we can kind of pinpoint a few of those um, that may help us to move forward. Um, so the big picture here is, you know, to, to use our time and talent as designers to do, to do what we do best and be creative and collaborative. Um, and it really serve as a, as a public service um, to schools and, and the, the teachers and students that are, are being affected uh, by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's obvious architects are tasked with protecting the health, safety, and welfare of the public. Uh, and this is a very immediate way for us to do that. Moving forward from today, just very briefly, we got about two weeks, or actually about 10 days to do some, some brainstorming, uh, come up with some ideas in response to what we hear today. Um, at that point, we're going to have a quick presentation. Uh, two fellows, we're going to divide it into four different groups, so we can be pretty quick, about a five-minute presentation, and then a few minutes for responses. And then those reviewers are going to kind of compile uh, small groups of participants that have similar ideas or, or maybe um, in some ways could, could be a little bit of a competitive or, a, sorry, a collaborative um, Okay, I think maybe Eric. I think I'm going to turn it over. Sorry, did I lose you guys? I think we caught the very last part of it, Eric. I think you were turning it over to me. Let me know if I should stop talking, though. Nope, go for it. It's all okay. you. Sorry, guys. Um, I'm Allison McKenzie. I am uh, with the Cincinnati chapter. A lot of my day-to-day -day work is with school districts and higher ed in the state. Um, so it became very clear to me early on in the pandemic when, you know, schools were pretty abruptly moved to a virtual format and uh, conversations started happening with my, my clients who are school districts, especially around, you know, what is school going to look like in the fall, uh, that this was going to be a big, a big challenge for everyone. So I think it's, it's great that we are all pooling our, our time and talent and uh, hopefully creativity into finding some solutions. I have pulled together some of the currently available resources right now. Um, and this is not to say that these are the only uh, challenges or the only areas uh, that school districts are going to be facing challenges in, but there are certainly some, some themes that I think you'll see today. Some of the assumptions that I have made in putting together this presentation are that if students return to on-site learning this fall, some level of social distancing will be required. Everyone seems to agree that we're still going to be in social distancing mode um, come fall. I think it's safe to assume that different regions of the state will have different challenges. So some of our schools are going to probably have some pretty significant outbreaks of COVID-19 when it's time to go back to school. Others may not be dealing with such high infection rates, so strategies might vary a little bit. There's also, I think, naturally going to be some differences in how urban, suburban, and rural schools are going to be able to deal uh, with, with COVID-19. So those are all things that I think we, we might want to think about. Uh, that kind of goes with bullet point three, policies and procedures themselves are likely to vary by district or institution based on the challenges they're facing as a district pre-COVID-19 as well as COVID-19 itself. Um, so all things for us to think about. When, when I started talking to um, my clients who are educators, it was pretty clear that they were all following kind of one of three paths as they started having their own internal conversations around COVID-19. 
And those revolved around these three potential areas for guidance. So some were relying heavily and, and waiting for guidance to be released from the CDC, so kind of national level guidance, if you will. Um, I would say the majority of clients were waiting for, or at least very interested in the guidance to be released by the Ohio Department of Education, so kind of a little more localized guidance. And some were kind of of the mindset, okay, we'll, we'll take a look at what guidance comes out, but this is really on us. We need to develop our own guidance, our own procedures, our own policies to understand how we're going to be dealing with this as we move into the fall. So I'm gonna be pulling um, actually information from all three of those areas. We're going to talk quite a bit about um, some currently available CDC guidance, some currently uh, draft form guidance from the Ohio Department of Education, and then we also conducted a survey as AIA Ohio to um, educators around the state to kind of ask what policies and procedures they were working on. So we're kind of pulling that aspect as well. So again, this, this presentation has a lot of information. I'm gonna go kind of fast through it um, because I don't wanna bog you down with, with so much data and, and terminology. I will make sure that Kate has a PDF of this after the presentation so that she can distribute it. Um, so you will get this word for word in case you wanna go back and look at anything. So um, let's start with the CDC gu level guidance. So we'll kind of work national and, and go down. Um, the, the information released by the CDC and available on their website as well as, as through other formats. Um, I know a lot of people have actually called the CDC directly saying, hey, what guidance can you give me um, before the information came out? So they've been working on these, these principles for quite a while. Um, so their topics are kind of broken into the areas that you see on the screen. We're going to, we're going to talk a little bit and summarize the ones that are in bold. Um, we're not going to talk so much about the preparing when someone gets sick uh, aspect. I think that's important information, but maybe not quite as applicable to what we're trying to do with this charrette. Um, feel free to check out their website for more of that information. So uh, we'll start kind of with their guiding principles. And this basically talks about the regionality and the, the difference between different locations for uh, you know, how you have to adapt to COVID-19. So uh, some districts are going to want to be in this lowest risk category. They are going to want students and teachers to engage in virtual only classes, activities, and events. They are likely going to say, we're not ready to come back to school in the fall. And you know, I think we're maybe becoming a little more optimistic that more and more districts, especially in Ohio, will have some form of on-site, in-building learning this fall. But I still have a few clients that are telling me, hey, we're not totally getting rid of this whole virtual only option when it comes time to fall. That's be, uh, to come back to school in the fall. That still might be our option. I think that more um, and probably most, to be quite honest, of our, our districts in Ohio and probably higher, uh, higher education institutions as well will fall in the CDC more risk category. So we're talking about more small in-person classes. We're going to kind of um, maybe group specific students together and kind of create little cohorts, which we'll talk about. Um, we're going to also make sure that we're doing our social distancing six feet apart, not sharing objects, no field trips, all that kind of stuff. Highest risk is, is kind of going back to normal. You know, full-size classrooms, not really worried about, worried about spacing, sharing classroom material supplies. So this presentation is really talking about that more risk category that's defined by CDC, which is probably what we're going to be able to help with the most. So keep that in mind as we move through. We will uh, kind of dive into the next CDC topic area, which is behaviors that reduce spread. So they have a whole bunch of, of topics which are, are pretty interesting under this kind of uh, reduce the spread behaviors that I think might be good idea starters for people working on this, this charrette. So, you know, some of these are pretty self-explanatory, like staying home when appropriate, obviously encouraging people not to come in if they have symptoms or have been recently tested for COVID-19. Hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette. So some big words uh, for some, some common sense uh, things here. So teaching and reinforcing hand washing with soap and water, and then um, you know covering coughs, throwing away tissues, washing hands, fun stuff. CDC is recommending uh, cloth face coverings by staff and students, especially older students as feasible. Um, but it's most essential in times when physical distancing is, is difficult. So when that six feet can't be uh, maintained. 
adequate supplies. So suggesting that we may need some additional supplies in our classroom, soap, hand sanitizer, um, extra paper towels, tissues, disinfectant wipes, uh, starting to get into some things like no touch trash cans. And I think that that would probably go for, you know, sinks that are no touch, uh, soap dispensers, that sort of thing as well. A lot of emphasis at the CDC level on signs and messaging. So posting signs in visible locations to promote these measures, broadcasting information, communicating with staff and families. So that whole communication aspect. Cleaning and disinfection. So um, especially focused on high touch surfaces and increasing the, the frequency of cleaning and disinfection as well. Um, while this seems pretty easy, I can tell you from conversations that I've had, and you'll also see this in our survey results, uh, cleaning and disinfection is a huge um, area of concern for our school clients. It's already a struggle. Increasing that, um, that uh, kind of uh, interval between cleaning as well as the, the depth of cleaning is definitely going to be something that challenges them. Shared objects, uh, discouraging the use of shared objects, um, keeping student belongings separated. So we've got some architectural implications here potentially of individual containers, cubbies, or areas for student uh, uh, objects. And then uh, again, making sure you've got enough supplies. Ventilation, so just barely touching on some, some more building infrastructure topics here, making sure that the ventilation systems are operating properly, um, maybe increasing outdoor air. Um, CDC guidelines in particular do not talk about filtration, but some other guidelines that have been published by other um, private research groups um, do talk a little bit more about uh, filtration, MERV rating for filters, that sort of thing. Um, opening windows and doors, things as simple as that here uh, are encouraged by CDC. Water systems, I thought this was an interesting one and one that doesn't necessarily spring to mind right away. Um, a lot of our schools have been fairly unoccupied for a while, so making sure that um, we are inspecting our water systems uh, in our schools to make sure that we're minimizing risk of Legionnaires disease. Um, making sure that if we're letting kids use drinking fountains, they're sanitized or maybe blocking them off um, altogether and asking kids to bring water. Modified layouts. So we're getting a little bit, you know, more into potential architectural features here. Spacing our seating, seating and desks at least six feet apart when feasible. Um, I know that I'm probably not the only architect that when these sorts of guidelines started coming out, I, I did an initial diagram in a typical classroom um, that I'm, I'm designing. And it really does reduce your capacity to half if you're lucky, um, probably a little less than half uh, if you have a lot of built-in casework and that sort of thing. So something to keep in mind. Um, simpler things like turning desks to face the same direction, having students sit on only one side of tables. Um, and then starting to get into this idea of creating distance between children on school buses, which is an entirely separate and worrisome um, aspect for, for school districts as far as transportation to school is concerned. Physical barriers and guides. Again, some potential architectural or at least furnishings implications here. Uh, install physical barriers such as sneeze guards where you can't maintain six feet apart. Um, and then providing those physical guides such as tape on the floors to help um, people understand the, the six foot uh, interval. Although I have a feeling that most of us are going to be pretty familiar with what six feet looks like pretty soon if we're, we're not already. And I know I'm also not the only one who continues to get um, furniture manufactured brand new products. You know, here's our new sneeze guard that we have. Here's our new um, tabletop. Uh, uh, separator. So a lot of a lot of response from from the marketplace already. Communal spaces, and this gets a really challenging for school districts. Um, so close communal use shared spaces, such as dining halls and playgrounds, if there's shared equipment. Um, this could potentially also um, apply to shared cafeterias. So where are these kids going to eat lunch? Um, and then again, we're back to adding physical barriers, and they're even talking about things like between bathroom sinks that aren't six feet apart. So kind of going to that, that detail level. Food service, expanding on that idea of cafeteria. Not only do we have to worry about the seating though in the cafeteria, 
but how are we going to serve food? Are we going to ask kids to bring their own meals? That's a problem in and of itself with, you know, free and reduced lunch and the availability of food for kids. I think most people are aware that even while most school districts went virtual, nearly all of them found a way to serve lunch to their free and reduced uh, meal kids at the very least while school was shut. So I don't see that going away. I think they're going to have to find a way to serve food. So some suggested area or some suggestions are serving food in classrooms uh, instead of the, the central cafeteria, using disposable food items like utensils and dishes, um, having prepackaged foods and definitely avoiding things that are buffet service or family style. So again, just minimizing that, that potential for contamination. We're gonna kind of go down into maintaining healthy operations now. So focusing more on the operations of the building. So the next category for the CDC's guidelines. Um, again, some of these are pretty, pretty common sense, uh, like op offering options for staff at higher risk. So maybe, maybe your immunocompromised staff or, or older staff members have the opportunity to telework or, or work from home instead of being on site. Um, so some more typical work, workplace um, accommodations uh, being suggested for some school staff. Uh, you might actually encounter students uh, that are the same, uh, that really, really need to have that virtual option. So I know that's something that school districts are dealing with. Um, regulatory awareness, just encouraging uh, schools to be aware of all of the changing uh, requirements as well as recommendations because uh, that in and of itself is is an ongoing process um, you know these capture today's guidelines but those these could change before uh, school actually gets into session really um, encouraging districts to pursue only virtual group events and gatherings and meetings uh, where possible Limiting any non-essential visitors, volunteers, and activities, uh, so that in a lot of cases includes extracurricular activities or sporting events, and then providing virtual activities in lieu of field trips. So again, do everything you possibly can virtual. So this is that idea of cohorting that I mentioned uh, just briefly at the very beginning. Um, a lot of recommendations are starting to come out around this idea of creating small groups of students. You may have heard actually that a couple universities in particular are really uh, considering this for at least their freshman classes. So creating a group of, you know, 20 or maybe even less students that kind of have all of their classes together. Um, and so in the case of, of K-12, maybe that means that the teacher moves from class to class instead of the students moving. So minimizing the number of people any, any particular student is exposed to at any, any given time. So creating these small co cohorts to limit the mixing between groups. Interesting concept. Staggered scheduling. This is one that I think the, all of the school districts that I work with are talking about a lot. Um, so does this mean that half their kids attend, you know, two days a week, the other half attend uh, two days a week, and then everyone's virtual on Friday? Maybe. That's definitely one of the recommendations that's been floating around. Also, the opportunity to maybe stagger arrival and drop-off times. So when everyone's arriving at and leaving the building are definitely two of the times in a, a typical day when you have lots of kids uh, in one place at, at one time. So what can we do to minimize that? Um, and again, um, staggered scheduling needs to be considered not just for the students, but also potentially for the staff within the school outside of the, the traditional teachers. They want every district to establish a point of contact to be the, the designated person to deal with COVID-19 concerns. They're suggesting a school nurse, not probably terribly architecturally important, um, asking that uh, schools consider participating with local uh, authorities for uh, providing guidance. Communication, again, is a big topic for operations as well as daily practice. Again, communicating um, not just with staff and uh, families about policies, but also uh, having procedures in place to know when students or staff have been diagnosed with COVID-19 or have symptoms. Having leave policies, again, kind of similar to other workplace recommendations around sick leave. Having backup staffing plans so that you don't have a bunch of teachers out uh, and no one to cover classrooms. Training your staff on protocols, of course. 
recognizing signs and symptoms. So those, those recommendations around daily health checks, you know, temperature screening, how does that actually happen if you're doing on the, it on the school site? Uh, encouraging any organizations that share your school building to also follow your considerations or, or maybe even not share facilities uh, for right now. A uh, lot of focus also on, on mental health, potentially some architectural uh, considerations there. Uh, so that was kind of our quick CDC cover, uh, uh, discussion. I, sorry, I, I know I'm going fast. I know this is a lot of info. We'll have a little bit of time at the end for some specific questions. Do you want to dive into Ohio Depart Department of Education uh, guidelines at this point? Um, some are very parallel. Uh, the thing to know about this Ohio uh, Department of Education or ODE reset and restart guide is it is still in draft form. This has not been officially released. They're uh, gathering information and discussion um, from teachers, from PTA groups, from, from a bunch of different um, kind of stakeholders to, to give feedback and to develop this, this guide for official release. So again, we're, we're just in draft here. Uh, their, their breakdown has quite a few topics. We're just going to really focus on the health and safety related logis logistical considerations, again, because I think they're the most specific to this uh, discussion. Um, and again, you're going to see some real parallels um, with the CDC guidelines as well. I thought this was interesting. Their, their uh, guide starts with kind of this reminder to consider a student's daily journey. So really understanding all of those areas of the physical school building that they, they come into contact with, all of the different uh, activities they do during the day. So considering not just the classroom environment, but all of their other movements throughout the day as well. So I think that's a really good thing to keep in mind. Here are their guiding principles. Uh, daily health assessments, so some similar things you saw with CDC, not coming to school if you have a fever, if you develop symptoms at school, you'll be sent home. Um, again, with the social distancing, maintaining at least six feet apart among all persons whenever possible, and they, they specifically indi indicate that this uh, also applies to school transportation. Using physical cues to enforce distancing, again, those, those floor markings or other, other visual cues. Uh, and then they also mention, again, in line with that whole daily student journey, creating transition schedules to minimize number of students, excuse me, in the common spaces. Face coverings, like CDC, they are recommending that you require all people on school grounds and using school transportation to wear face coverings. Uh, they also specifically say that uh, school nurses or personnel should be using actual PPE. Good hygiene, similar here, hand washing, hand sanitizers, making them available. Frequency of cleaning, not just in the building, um, but actual supplies, classrooms, um, cafeterias. Uh, suggesting that cleaning and disinfection should be done after each cohort, so they're, they're kind of talking about this cohort idea as well, of students leaves a facility or classroom. So between class changes, between groups and cafeteria, again, could be very, very challenging for, for many districts. Uh, student learning, again, um, encouraging uh, communication and uh, kind of getting the word out on the strategies that that students should be using employee training as well understanding how to to deal with those who are showing those COVID-19 uh, symptoms again similar to the CDC guidelines um, indicating prohibiting visitors to school or really limiting it to emergency situations uh, requiring those temperature checks uh, for visitors as well as uh, staff and students a lot of policies here as well as far as uh, communicating exposure, potential exposure, pretty, pretty similar to CDC guidelines. They are trying to set ex uh, specific guidelines for people returning to school after they've been quarantined with COVID-19, which I thought was interesting. So really trying to um, make sure people uh, are not returning too early. So read all those details if you're if you're interested in exactly what that entails. 
And then they, they have a section that deals specifically with additional precautions required during flare-ups. So the, the precautions we just talked about, um, you know, might be in a normal situation. We've got some COVID cases, but not a ton. Uh, but if we start seeing those numbers tick up in the district, we might want to prohibit things uh, that, that were previously allowed or, or, or make, the, make controls a little more stringent. So even more cleaning, uh, making playground equipment off use uh, uh, altogether. And if we get to the point where we've just got a ton of cases moving into that lowest risk category of using remote learning. Uh, also uh, contain in the ODE guidelines our communication plan requirements. Um, and that was it for ODE. So we're going to enter the last uh, section here, and then we can have some questions and discussion. Uh, so I can stop, uh, stop uh, talking all on my own, which will be great. So we did create an AIA Ohio survey, which we distributed to quite a few uh, K-12 educators and some higher education administrators. Um, we know that we kind of hit them all at the worst possible time as they were trying to, you know, go through graduations, wrap up the school year, that sort of thing. So we, we did get a handful of responses, especially around K-12, so I want to share those with you. Um, we actually only got one higher ed response, so we did not tabulate those uh, results just because it wasn't a very big sample size. Um, but I think we did get some helpful comments and feedback um, from, from K-12 educators especially. Our topics on the survey included kind of some of those topics along the, that daily journey of a student. Uh, so we had some general questions, some related to busing and transportation, some specifically about arrival and departure, classroom environment. These are kind of the topics that we broke it down into. So I'm gonna give you a, a little bit of feedback on each of these topics that we received. As far as general questions go, we, we asked kind of on a scale of one to 10, how optimistic are you that your district will be able to allow some degree of instruction in physical facilities this fall versus you know, all virtual, uh, which is how they ended up uh, the last school year. Average response was seven, um, and I thought an interesting comment that I pulled for everyone was, we are more optimistic today than we were two weeks ago. So feeling like we're moving in a, in a good direction for getting a handle on this. On a scale of one to 10, um, there should be a how in there. How successfully did you feel your district was able to implement virtual learning to finish 2019, 2020 school year? Again, average response was right around that seven. Um, we had an interesting comment that at 7 to the two through 12, you know, students already had laptops and it, they felt like that went much, much smoother. Um, it was a little bit more challenging in K-6 where, where fewer districts are currently one-to-one -one with computers. They had to come up with systems to get computers to students, uh, those that didn't have them. Uh, so that made things challenging. Busting and transportation, similar kind of scale of confidence question about how confident are you that busting and transportation can be accomplished if social distancing requirements are in place when we return to school? You can see this drops all the way to a three. Um, so an interesting comment was, with social distancing in place, we can get roughly 10 kids on a 77 passenger bus. So uh, that, that particular respondent said they don't think a school district, any school district in the state has a fleet that could support that. Um, we also asked a question regarding what, regarding what specific strategies are you considering for busing and transportation? The two in bold were the most common responses, and you could pick more than one here. So a lot of, of people did pick multiple strategies, but almost everyone said that they were either considering total elimination of bus service um, or reduced student capacity for each bus. Arrival and dismissal, how confident are you that a safe protocol for arrival and dismissal of students can be implemented? Kind of mid-range, we're at a 5.6, so one, one being not confident at all, 10 being very confident, right down the middle. What strategies are being considered around arrival and dismissal? Again, the bolded uh, strategies were the, the most common responses, staggered arrival and departure times, re reduced student capacity and or staggered days of attendance each week. Um, it really seemed from the survey responses that people were banking on some sort of reduced student capacity strategy or staggered schedule happening in order to make fall possible at all. 
Classroom environment, how confident are you that your typical classroom can be modified to meet social distancing guidelines? Uh, pretty mid-range here as well, 5.5. Some people felt like they were in better situations because their classrooms were newer and more flexible. Um, so that was an interesting comment I felt. These were the common strategies being considered for classroom environment. Again, in bold, reducing student capacity or staggered days of attendance each week to make uh, the classroom counts work. Didn't seem to be a whole lot of interest, at least from the respondents to our survey, uh, around using larger spaces in the building, such as gyms and cafeterias to spread students out. Not a whole lot when it came to interest in physical barriers between students. Um, or these others. Um, I think that some of that is just that, again, they're very early in the planning process and maybe they haven't seen solutions that will really provide that, that option for them. Lunch. Uh, how confident are you that your lunch service can be modified to meet COVID-19 guidelines? We're at a four. So again, pretty low on the confidence scale. Sorry, that comment uh, got copied and pasted and should have been modified. Um, a lot of people did have additional confidence based on their ability to serve lunch during the, the all virtual learning uh, period this past year. So that gave them some confidence that they could at least come up with some strategy, but they weren't really sure what that strategy was. Um, all of these seem to be kind of on the table as far as our respondents were concerned. So no, none are in bold because there wasn't one or, one or two that really stood out. Um, but this idea of, you know, reduced student capacity, um, eating lunch in classrooms, prepackaged or grab and go foods, um, disposable plates and utensils, cleaning, hand washing stations. I think all, all of that is under consideration. Recess um, actually seems to be an area of great concern. Um, how confident are you that, sorry, I'm, I'm noticing all my typos now. I swear that I proofread this, but sometimes you're just too close. Uh, how confident are you that your recess operations can be modified to meet COVID-19 guidelines? 3.5 and, and actually the comment, not at all. So I think that's a, a big area of concern, especially for K-12 uh, districts uh, that are struggling with, with what activities actually can um, be allowable in recess. Um, again, thinking about these staggered recess times or reduced student count. Um, and maybe even modifying the activities that are allowed during recess. Special subjects, uh, we asked some general questions around, you know, when you consider special subjects such as performing arts, visual arts, gym, special education, library, computer, and science labs, what are some of your concerns? So we got some, some just general um, feedback. So are there specific concerns? Uh, yes, spacing, disinfecting, overcrowding, touching of materials after others. Um, this one's pretty, pretty candid. It's hard to find a topic that is not of great concern. They're saying their building is at capacity and they have no extra space. They already have traveling teachers, limited open spaces to convert. Basically, we are scrambling. And then finally, a vast majority of these subjects require a large number of students in an assigned area. So of course, that is a, a concern when it comes to capacity. Uh, athletics, uh, again, uh, average response is four here, so pretty low on the optimism scale of athletics being able to happen. And as can probably be expected, you know, the confidence will vary greatly depending on the sport in question. Tennis and golf, we can probably find a way for those to happen. Um, the, the team and contact sports are, are probably a much more challenging. Um, many of the respondents said that they are strongly considering not allowing team sports while social distancing policies are in place. Visitors and deliveries, um, not allowing visitors in the building, um, scheduling deliveries to minimize congestion, potential lobby modifications such as sneeze guards, and then again, uh, the typical modified or increased cleaning protocols are all potential strategies. Um, there was one comment that I wanted to share that they said that they, you know, especially at the younger grade levels, have numerous volunteers, um, and they think that they are really going to need to to limit that and change how they're they're structuring that that volunteering to minimize the number of, of people students are coming into contact with. 
just that note uh, that we only got one response for higher ed. So, um, you know, I think that that we're open to hearing some about higher ed, but I think K-12 seems to be where the main challenges are and probably where most of us are going to want to focus uh, for this charrette. We've included some resources where this information came from, as well as a couple additional ones. Um, as I've mentioned before, you know, these are changing on a daily and weekly basis, just based on new information coming out, new guidelines being developed. Uh, so I think they are uh, valid resources for everyone to, to take a look at. I do actually have uh, a few more minutes. I, I originally thought I'd only be here for 40 minutes, but I can now be here until a little after three. Um, so I'd love to participate in some questions and discussion about this information. And real quick, Allison, too, I uh, understand that uh, Jeff from North Canton is on the phone, too. So if we have questions specifically to school administrators, um, not to put you on the spot, Jeff, but you may be able to give us a little better insight um, into the, the intricacies. Excellent. So I don't know, Eric, do you want to moderate any questions? Not sure what the, the best way to do this virtually is. Yeah, I guess um, if anyone has any questions, um, sometimes we use the chat, but maybe it's okay just to, to unmute yourself and ask a, ask a question. I've got a question. Um, when sending out the survey, was, there, was it just sent out to school districts or was it broken down by kind of schooling type? Um, as a parent of a middle schooler and an elementary schooler, you know, the way those kids interact in school is vastly different between the two. So would, were the surveys kind of split up that way or was it just overall school districts? So our, our distribution list, if you will, for surveys was um, admittedly kind of um, haphazard is a little too, too tough of a term, but we really sent it out to people that we had contacts with, you know, uh, clients that we'd work with if we if we are parents you know sending out to contacts at schools so we kind of uh, formulated this, the survey as k-12 versus higher ed um, we knew that a lot of the contacts that we had were more at the the district-wide level um, so we didn't necessarily break it down into to more specific grade levels um, perhaps if we had had more time that would have been a good way to structure it but um, the survey was just group k-12 versus higher ed And unfortunately, I'll add, that's also how the CDC and ODE guidelines are formulated. None of them seem to break it up into smaller grade bands. It's all schools. I've got a question. Um, it, along that line, is it um, broken up into Montessori type schools and, and that type of learning and, and the way that the students kind of, you know, teach themselves in groups or you know, sh should we be looking or focusing on that, or is it just primarily a uh, normal school, public school system? Yeah, none of the guidelines that I am aware of at this point um, break it down into anything like that. And I think that's a great point and something that, that administrators are definitely going to need help with. Um, making accommodations in a traditional cells and bells type school where you've got, you know, classrooms lining corridor is going to look a lot different than making accommodations in a Montessori school or a more flexible project-based learning um, environment. Uh, so those are, are definitely going to look a lot different uh, when we're talking about what's going to be necessary. But again, I think there's a ton of room for us to, to really provide a lot of guidance here um, from our own professional experience. And just to add on that a little bit, um, you'll notice that the plans that we're providing, um, we kind of have examples from both types of schools. So um, when you're looking at this, you can kind of choose which, which type you want to tackle. Um, That's a good point just to touch on that too. There's um, a Dropbox link that in case you're not aware that we have some background plans uh, for a variety of different schools that in case you don't happen to work in that sector or just uh, need some generic um, kind of floor plans to look at, those are available for your reference. Uh, this is Erin Curley. Um, so in the survey, was there any indication, um, I can't remember all the selections, but of in those settings where it's more like group oriented, where it'd be like gym or even on bus transportation, was there any indication of 
whether the schools were looking at, you know, further separating with partitions or even have the students wear face masks and face shields or something along those lines. Was there, did it get into that kind of level where they would have been able to choose an option like that? A lot of uh, respondents did choose that they were um, at least considering, if not planning to require face coverings um, in a lot of the areas, not just the classroom environment, but those special environments um, and, and common spaces throughout the building. Um, the, the times that kind of a physical separation or sneeze guard or barrier or whatnot, if you, um, whatever you'd like to call it, were an option, um, the, no, no respondents really felt like that was a, a specific strategy that they were considering now. And again, I, I don't know that that means that it's not a valid strategy or one that should be considered. I'm just not sure that they've gotten to that level of thinking yet. Um, I think they're hanging a lot right now on this ability to, you know, only do partial classes or staggered schedule, um, that sort of thing. So I think that there's likely a much finer level of detail that's going to be required to even make that a possibility, but again, just not sure they've gotten there yet. Okay, thank you. This is Kate from AI Ohio. I just want to make sure that everybody on the call knows that um, the PowerPoint slides that Allison shared today, I will, I will um, put on the AI Ohio charrette page, a link to them, if that works, Allison. And, and thank you. And then um, the same thing for the link to the Dropbox where the program files are. Um, so the floor plans that Melinda mentioned. The, so I'll send that link for the AI Ohio charrette page out to everybody who registered or was on this call. If you don't get it, it's because I don't have your email address, just reach out. Thank you. This is uh, Aaron Cook, I'm a student from Ohio State, and I'm one of the AIAS officers there. Has there been any talk by especially the larger school districts like City of Columbus to open up the buildings that they keep, keep vacant? I know they cycle through school buildings and move students around, so there might be some room for expansion. Has anybody talked about that or heard anything? I have had some very informal conversations with some CPS, so Cincinnati Public Schools, uh, administrators who don't think that that is um, much of an option. I know that, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the cleaning and sanitizing that we've talked about through a lot of this is going to be a challenge even in the, the buildings that they're currently operating. I think that the availability of staff is going to be really cut into the, the possibility of expanding their footprint. Um, so I, I'm not sure if that's true of the other large school districts, but that, that is the feedback I've received locally. Okay, thank you. But I think conceptually that idea is something to play with, even though maybe it doesn't seem real world financially feasible at the moment. I think the, the point of the charrette is to kind of generate ideas and, and explore those possibilities. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's a good thought. Great. I think the idea of using non traditional buildings that sit vacant for most of the week, you know, look like um, event facilities or the YMCA or churches even have large gathering places that could be used if we need to spread students out into the cohorts for the that might be an option for sure. So. Yeah, unfortunately, the, all the districts are getting hit with a double whammy of COVID and then having all their funding cut both locally oh, from sure. the sure. state. Yeah, excellent timing. Any other questions, guys? Jeff, is there uh, anything you'd like to add to, that we missed on or any, any later developments that you'd care to bring to our attention? I think he's on here still. Maybe not. I, I have something real quick to kind of just bring up as, as a thought too. Um, there, there is an aspect of risk with a lot of this, like how risky are we willing to get with what we're going to try, you know, who's, who's going to be more conservative and more risky about what they're willing to allow. And I think 
if Jeff's still on or, or if anyone has any perspective to uh, to add to it, I mean, what level of risk do you think is permissible as far as school's comfortability? I mean, does it seem like in general, for those of you that have uh, education clients and things that they're like terrified, want to lock everything down across the board, or is it more like, um, you know, they, they think that that things will be sort of calculated risks a little bit at a time, biting off a piece here and there, becoming more comfortable. Um, I guess, how does that, how does that discussion feel in the world right now? Well, David, based on some of the discussions that I've had, you know, it's, it's really biting off a piece at a time and, and slowly working its way into it. Um, I don't think anybody's, especially with the funding cuts and everything else that's going on and, you know, limiting sporting events then puts students at risk for getting into trouble, right? I mean, we all know that activities keep kids focused. Um, so nobody really wants those things to happen, but at the same time, it, it's a health concern. So I would definitely say it's, it's more of the, you know, biting off a piece, not just full shutdown. So, and, and utilizing um, virtual as much as possible. Yeah, I was going to say that the, the other variable that I think plays into that with some school districts is that I feel like um, based on conversations I've had, some districts feel like virtual learning actually went pretty well. Um, so continuing to do that is probably more palatable for them. Whereas other districts, virtual learning was a disaster and they never made contact with a quarter of their kids and they, they know that that is probably not a feasible option for them. So I think that the, the success of virtual learning is going to play into their, their level of risk tolerance as well. The districts that the districts are working with, um, like Aaron said, we're um, sort of in a quandary right now because they're not sure what the state is going to say. Um, however, they are planning uh, for potential um, uh, social distancing of students. How they do that is, is where they're, where they're um, trying to be a little more creative in regards to um, how students either um, in regards to time are taught or how students um, are separated with, within the buildings that they have while maintaining, which is really critical, while maintaining the direction of education that each school district has, because they're all different in regards to how they approach education. So it's, it's trying to balance the two. And, and I also think that a key to note is, and I don't remember who asked the question about the surveys and, and which schools they went to, whether, I think that plays a huge role, right? Because definitely six, and, and lower, they, ha they had much more difficulty with the virtual learning because they didn't have access to laptops, iPads, whatever. Whereas I think the um, older students clearly could adapt much quicker. So, and, and Allison, I know you talked about that a little bit. So I think that does, we have to consider that too. And even with the survey results, if it was a, a district that was mainly focused on, you know, Montessori schools or something, that that does factor in because so and that starts to come into play with whether a district is one-to-one -one in regards to computers or That's, pads or laptops or whatever or their their access to them right i mean right. A lot of urban schools yeah the, the three districts i'm working with one's one-to-one -one and one isn't and the other one's sort of in the middle um and and each one of them has to think differently about how um, how each district is going to approach, um, you know, not only this past year, but, but years in the future. Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Faiza. Uh, I want to say that it's kind of going off of what David was saying in one of the comments about walking in the students' shoes. Uh, it's probably going to be important to consider that not all the kids are going to have the same a home life and how conservative their families are about the situation. So some might feel more at risk coming to school while other kids' families might not be as cautious so they won't feel nervous or scared at all, which will affect how they react to the different precautions that are taking place. And I think, 
along that same lines, you know, access to tablets would come into play or access to virtual learning, right? Like right. you have a lot of students who, you know, they don't have access to, to meals. Well, they probably don't have access to um, the virtual software either. And even if the school gives it to them, are they at risk for that being stolen or taken away from them in some way um, because of maybe their, their living environment? So. I can, I'll share that the most confident school district that I've had this conversation with uh, plans to only bring K through four back to school and distribute them through all of their buildings. So they're getting social distancing space and they're getting space on their transportation system. Not that that's quite enough yet, but, uh, and then five through 12 uh, work remotely um, and the theory there is also they're potentially old enough to uh, be self-sufficient and stay at home without daycare. I think that that's a really important point because the way a K through four kid is taught and educated and learns is vastly different once you get to an older older group. Um, you know, as we are you know kind of experiencing you know my nine-year-old going to going to school here and one of our friends has essentially said you know you're you're acting like these these elementary kids are essentially in college right now because they've got to be so responsible on their own they've got to do all their homework they they're really more independent and i think it goes beyond just providing making sure they've got computers to take home to do the virtual learning but they learn differently than the way a middle schooler does or a high schooler does I just want to piggyback off of that because <clears throat> I heard that some of the students, even though they, they were sent homework and were given tablets, then some of them didn't know how to use them, the middle kids didn't know how to use them, and, or didn't even know how to send the homework or even to upload the homework, and the parents didn't know how to do it. So the kids still, even though you know, they may have had the resource there, they still couldn't get the work done or know how to get the work done. So it is a very interesting dynamic there. Did, did we want to have any sort of a brief discussion about what happens after this meeting with, with these efforts and, and what to expect? Yeah, I think David, I think that's a good idea. Um, I just want to make sure we had any, any other specific questions that we can answer regarding kind of the programming side. Um, I touched on it briefly earlier, but you know, the next step is to spend some time over the next 10 days um, kind of coming up with some ideas. You're obviously not going to solve everything. There's a lot of layers, a lot of different, um, small problems that we can work on, but the idea I think with, with 60 some of us, we can start to tackle um, bits and pieces and, and then kind of put our heads together as groups, small groups after that to really put together something that um, is impactful and useful hopefully for um, the school groups moving forward. So like I said, over the next 10 days, the 12th we're gonna meet again, um, I think at one o'clock, one to three is the scheduled time. Um, and I guess uh, coming up if, if there's a specific time that works for you in those days, let us know. So we'll, we'll schedule you accordingly, but we'll, we'll send out a schedule of when you'll present. Um, and then just to, to cover our bases, we'll have you submit your uh, presentation PDF format to the Dropbox. So we'll have that just in case there's technology issues. But I think the best way to do the presentation would be for the presenter to have um, control of the material and share their screen so that you can change the slides or, or point out certain aspects as you're presenting. They'll be short, right? Five minutes isn't, isn't a long time. So um, try to be succinct, try to get to the point of what you're investigating and uh, be as clear as possible. Um, and then after that, we're gonna have, uh, again, our jurors kind of help put together some teams that have similar thoughts and hopefully there's some um, collaboration that can come out of that that will advance those ideas to, to be a little bit more polished. Um, and then we'll have a final presentation in a similar format as this uh, Zoom meeting. And uh, hopefully we'll get an audience of, of others that, that need to hear this information. And again, we'll record that so it can be distributed to other school districts or, or higher education. Uh, so that's kind of the big picture. It's kind of quick. Uh, we've got, you know, about a month or so to, to do all this. But we wanted to be timely. If, if schools are going to use this information before school starts back up, we, we know that time is of the essence. So um, we're very appreciative for all of you guys this time. I know you, you're already busy with other things and this kind of seems like more work, but 
um, it's very valuable and I think it's kind of our, our duty as architects to, to put these ideas forward. So thank you all. Um, if there's questions about the, the logistics or um, other things, we can address that too, but hopefully um, we can follow up with an email with the links like Kate indicated. It should be pretty straightforward. And I think Kate is going to reach out to understand if anyone wants to present in the initial session as a team instead of as an, as an individual, because I know there are some, maybe some groups within offices that are kind of working together. So um, Kate will kind of be a liaison to understand that schedule. That's right. Yeah. If you did intend to do a group presentation, let us know so we know to schedule that accordingly. And you, you'll let us know. I'll reach out and communicate. I'll share the Dropbox link. Um, and then I'll, I'll share a, so that you can, you'll be able to, to upload your materials. Um, and, the, and then just a quick clarification on June 12th, we'll run four concurrent um, juries. So we're not going to try and, and get through all of you on one call. Uh, you'll be separated into four groups and you'll be able to stay on as long as you wish on the on the jury you're, in which you're participating, if that makes sense. So is it rather open if we, like, can we focus on one particular grade band and one particular issue like lunch, or is it? Yeah, exactly. Pick, pick a problem that you know is out there and, and tackle that, because I think that there is a ton of opportunity and we're all going to have different different areas of interest. This is Tom Kennedy. I, I, can you all hear me? Yep. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, I've actually gotten involved in this recently because a, a customer's uh, very interested in, in doing things with their buildings. Um, and I come at it, I'm a, a consulting engineer, so I'm coming at it from a mechanical systems side, but it's kind of becoming a, a immersed in some of this. And one of the things that um, kind of keeps coming up, I, I've been on other conferences on this subject as well, Kind of related to that and one of the things that kind of keeps coming up a little bit is um sort of the question of uh, how do you prove it um so as we all think about notions ideas um what is our measuring stick um how do we go about kind of determining that this idea will be effective because of X. Um, and it's a farther reaching question, of course, as well, if we start to look at some of the physical things that are modifications to these buildings and these school districts are going to the taxpayers to ask for it, at some point I think the taxpayers might say, well, we spent X, how do we know that did any good? So sort of that, what is our metric for that this will accomplish what? And I don't know if maybe somehow in this process we need to come up with some sort of a criteria for how we determine that. Because um, obviously some things will cost a lot, some will cost a little. And it might be that some of the ones that cost little are the most effective and some of the ones that cost quite a bit maybe are ineffective. But I think that effectiveness is probably something we may need to consider how we address. It's a good point. Um, the goal of this really is, you know, focusing on ideas, getting ideas forward that um, we as architects and engineers may have, you know, better knowledge of. Um, it's by no means, you know, a final answer for anyone to take forward and implement immediately, but it's, it's a way for them to start thinking about solutions. Um, I totally agree. You have to have dollars and cents and practicality in mind. Um, but I don't want to disclude um, any ideas based on it's going to be too expensive or the practicality of it. It's, it's really just to push ideas forward. So it's sort of tough to suspend reality for a bit, but we're, that's what we're sort of trying to do is find big picture ideas or, or maybe very specific ideas that uh, may or may not work for everyone. So we're about three o'clock here. If there's no other questions, I'll go ahead and wrap up. I want to respect everyone's time, but um, I do appreciate everyone today. Um, if there's follow-up questions that we need to circle back to, feel free to email us and um, we'll try our, try our best to follow up. But 
looking forward to seeing what we come up with. And, and I think it's really awesome that um, AI Ohio is, is positioning ourselves to be leaders in this. And um, hopefully we can put some ideas forward that will really help um, with the future of education. So thank you guys all today. Uh, Kate, anything else we need to do before we wrap up? I think that's it. I am sending that email out to everybody who registered with the links um, next. So it'll be this afternoon. If you don't get it from me, um, reach out to me. I put my email address in the chat. Perfect. Thank you guys yeah, all. Thanks, thanks everybody. Nice to see everyone. Nice to see you too. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Have a good day.